following interview was conducted with Carl Snow, digital initiative librarian for the Purdue University Oral History Program, took place on Wednesday, September 19, 2012, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerita of Library Science. Good morning, Carl, and welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, Katie. Okay, tell us a little about where and when you were born and family in early years. <laughs> Long time ago. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm one of three children. Where were you born? Um, well, technically Syracuse, New York. I lived on a farm outside, about 30, min 30 minutes west of there. The, uh, it was, I was the first child where mom went to a hospital, otherwise they were home deliveries. And uh, evidently it was a blizzard when they went to get me and they had a terrible time getting in the hospital to get mom and I home. So anyway, we grew up on a farm. It was originally dairy and then uh, dad uh, converted over to poultry for egg production. Start out school in a one-room schoolhouse. And uh, how many classes were in there? Like for eight grades or four? Uh, no, uh, I'm trying to think. I think it started out five or six grades. Uh, two grades to a plant to a, a room. No, it was only one room. Oh. So there was one grade per row. Oh wow! Interesting. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed it. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot, lot more fun than the central school. But uh, it was too expensive to operate, so after, let's see, three years there, I never went to the, never went to kindergarten. I went to, uh, started right out in first grade, so it was three years, and then they shut it down, and I, they sent us all up to uh, the Jordan School. And so I started in fourth grade. Like I said, I had a whole lot more fun in the one-room school. It was like family. Oh, yeah, right, exactly. So. When you went to the fourth, uh, beyond fourth grade, did you have to take a bus, or was it close to mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, yeah. It was seven miles. But the one-room schoolhouse was closer to where you lived, or, or not? Mm-hmm, it's just down the hill. Oh. Interesting. They did provide a station wagon for for the young, young kids. Sure. So I rode in a station wagon a lot of times. Plus it was good weather and then I just walked back and forth. Yeah, okay. Well, tell us a little about high school. Where'd you go to high school? And right any there classes? in Jordan. Any Jordan special pro class that you took or activities? No, I was on the farm, so it was. You helped on the farm? Yeah, it was farm or school. Not that I liked farming, but that was this the, the family. That's right. Okay. So, how large was the high school? Was it? Close? Oh no, it was like thirty-five kids in my graduating class. Wow. Yeah. Then what? Then what came next? Did you go to on to college? Mm-hmm. Okay. Where'd you go to college? Ah, uh, went all over the place. Uh, Mom and Dad had bought a house in St. Pete, Florida. My sister was living there. And uh, went down there to the junior college for a semester. Really didn't like it, so I moved back home. Went to Onondaga Community in Syracuse. Your parents still had their house in where you were born and raised. Oh yeah. And then, but they had one in Florida too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh well, they sold that house later on, and then a few years later they bought a mobile. Yeah, you know, like most retirees. Sure. So uh, they, uh, so I went to uh, Onondaga, and at that time it was in a uh, renovated office building, I think. It wasn't a real campus, but it was, it was convenient. Went through there as far as I could, and then transferred up to. It was a two-year program? Yeah. Two so Although, because of all my transfers, I, 
I don't know if I ever did get an associate out of that. I think I just transferred the credits. Okay. And uh, went up to Oswego State. That's one of the state university in New York. It's right on Lake Ontario. Mm, about an hour away. Lived up there. What was campus like? What was college like? Oh, yeah. up there? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in elementary ed. To, there were about 5,000 students, so it wasn't large. Mm. You lived on campus? Mm. Mm. Well, just a little bit off campus. I had a car. They had a men's residence hall called Fallbrook, and the uh, it was an old ladies' home that they bought and uh, converted it. Converted huh? it, and it was a lot of fun. It was a small dorm. Uh, there were kids from all over the state. We, I can remember we would uh, have water fights and water would be cascading down the stairwell and the lights would be flashing on and off because of the water shorting out the wiring. And Lots of resident, indoor activities. Yeah, resident didn't like that. So he and his wife lived in one end. They had their own apartment. But, uh, you know, about 2 o'clock in the morning, he'd pull a fire alarm in the middle of winter and it roll out. That was his revenge. So, uh, uh, fun and know. games, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, after, uh, what came next after graduation? Oh, I uh, decided I didn't like elementary school. Did you do any teaching at all? Or? No. Oh. But you were certified for it? Uh, or not? Never really got certified for it. Okay. Uh, got married. Did you meet your wife in, in college? At Oswego. Yeah. Okay. Connie and I got married in December. Let's see, 65, I commuted from Liverpool, New York, to finish up up in Oswego. And I really enjoyed AV, the AV classes that I took. And uh, one of the profs thought I could do well. He was a grad of IU, so he recommend, recommended me for the master's program. And they accepted. So Connie and I moved out here in, let's see, about probably January of 66. No, no January 67. And uh, that's when you started at IU? Yeah. Uh -huh. So I did the uh, master's program down there. I uh, had a great assistantship with, uh, with them running their videotape distribution center. It was kind of hard because I always enjoyed working like that, worked my tail off. And I've never been a real academic, so uh, trying to balance the two, it was, it was a juggling act, but uh, I graduated. Oh, did you have, did you have an, uh, live on campus? Did you have an apartment or yeah, off campus? Yeah, we lived in Eigenman. Oh, okay. Was that Eigenman? No. That was a great student. It was right, built in the side of a hill on campus. I can't remember the uh -huh. name now. It was, it was a lot of, there was married student housing. It was a good place. Sure. We enjoyed it. We had a lot of friends down there. Uh, Connie substitute taught. I went to school. Had the great assistantship. So it helped. We was made our way through. Two-year program, or I was only one about year. A year. Okay. And, uh, and I. Dave Moses early on asked me to interview up here, and I kind of put him off. It was in the summertime of '68. Didn't have a job. Didn't have a job. It was getting toward fall. We 
going to do a stupid thing like move to Sacramento, California and have no job prospect. And David called and said, you will come and interview. So, How did he contact, did he just contact you or did you know Dave? No, he, uh, he, he had gone through the placement service at IU, okay. the AV Center. And their reputation for AV was, was national ranked. So, uh, so that's how he, uh, that's so how he came he up for an interview, huh? Got me and said, you will come up, and it was on a Saturday. Um, and it was, we drove up early that day. Came in, uh, oh, Teal Road, South 4th Street, and was not really impressed with our first view. Um, we'd never really driven up here before. And, uh, I don't know, we parked out here on campus someplace. I don't know exactly where we met David, but I can remember sitting down in the old v AV Center and uh, talked with him for a while. He, uh, I said, well, you know, this is kind of flatland. We're used to hills. So he, he took us out for a drive and drove us up and down Happy Hollow Hill. <clears throat> yeah, the one and only. So, yeah, you got that in 4th Street. You missed Street. 9th Street. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, uh, by noon I'd accepted the job. And by 5 o'clock that night, we had a, an apartment. We, you remember Beaujardin. That's where, where we lived for a year. So, yeah, you know, it was kind of really informal, but uh, it was really great. Dave, uh, I respect Dave. He... He was a quality man, and he had, he just did things the right way. You don't find that today. He, but he was not politically correct. He'd poke fun at things. I don't know if you Mary, remember Mary Gibbs. Yeah, he, he poked some fun with Mary. I don't know if she ever got upset about it, but, you know, it was racial. I remember when I wanted to uh, get, get a computer, and he looked at me and said, hey, I always thought a warm secretary was better than a computer. <laughs> you know that you, you just knew not to take him seriously. Right. Well, tell us a little about your the position, film librarian. That's what you were hired as? You yeah. talk about the center? Make yeah. some comments on that? What exactly was your duties and what did that involve? Well, the you, AV was, Center. Did you replace somebody or was this a new position or? No, this was, I was replacing David. Oh, okay. Uh, and I can't remember who he replaced. L.D. Miller. L.D. had passed away. And he was the one in charge, wasn't he? He and was he, the uh, director. Director, right, okay. I remember Dave telling me about that. And, I uh, and when he passed away, uh, Moriarty promoted David into LD's position, mm -hmm. okay. and uh, and then he was replacing. Actually, he had to hire three professionals that fall. He prof hired for Alice Chung to be the media cataloger. Uh, Carl Stafford to handle equipment distribution, and I, I was the film librarian over mm -hmm. that end of the operation. Uh, I think it was the other division of the AV Center was the Media Research Institute, or Institute? I don't think so, it was Media Research. And I think that was Warren, I can't remember his last Cybert. name. Cyber. Warren Cyber. Okay. And so there was you know, technically Warren and me working under Dave. Uh, but Dave's 
was housed downstairs, so he was always there. Sure. And that, that was, I think that was fine. It took me a while, you know, being a young guy, I wanted to run the place in some respects. In other respects, eh, I, I really didn't. Uh, so it, it worked out well. All right. We, we worked together. Tell me the collect for the researchers. The collection was what sort of films were in the film library? Educational. Or oh, they were all educational. Okay, okay, that's key. There was, it was a whole media collection. There was uh, slides, sixteen okay. millimeter film, uh, film strips. There were some records. You know, it was a different formats. It was a lot of different formats. It wasn't just. Uh, film. Later on, of course, film was uh, displaced by the various video formats. Uh, slides and film strips went out. Mm -hmm. uh, a large part of the collection was, was the slide sets that we distributed for the co-op extension around the state, so we shipped those things in and out. Did you have contact with all the departments on campus today? That's where they would come for their films? Oh, yeah. Okay. And we rented films. We would charge back to their departmental accounts, but we would research, locate, and rent films. Bring them in, set them up on the equipment, take them back, and get them shipped out again. So that was a, that was a job and a half. And trying to find the rental sources was a real, yeah. real pain. I, uh, I can't remember. There was I worked with the consortium of the university film centers and put together a printed union catalog. I think it lasted two publishings, but still, yeah, it made our job a whole lot easier. Oh, sure. Not a whole no, not accurate. Anything you put in print is but done. But a resource source that you yeah. Needed. Right. It was better than thumbing through individual catalogs, sure. right. okay. you know. So I can remember the first one of the first things we couldn't get one film for a guy, uh, one of the profs on campus through the normal rental sources, and I checked with Ball State and they had it, but Ball State didn't rent. So Connie and I took a road trip and we went over and they loaned it to us. And you brought it back. Brought it back. And then uh, shipped it back to them. So, oh, good. you know, there were a lot of those things going on. It should be, you know, it was fine. Right, okay. Um, uh, then the reorganization. In 81, the AV Center changed, didn't it? Yeah, well, there was a, several reorganizations. Oh. Uh, when, well, first thing, I started out under Moriarty. He was a he was a character. Uh, Irish Catholic, cursed like a sailor. But the greatest thing was, and I didn't appreciate it at the time. Up in the uh, second floor, of Stewart Center, they had the mechanical sweet shop, a vending area. You remember that, don't you? Um, there was a lounge. There was a lounge. Right. And he always made it a point to be up there around 2 o'clock any day he could. And if he and all of the assistant directors. Yeah. And you, you could go in there and BS about sports or business or anything at all. I remember that all. because a lot of them used to go through the second floor, because I was in Stewart mm -hmm. Center in the reference, and they would go through there because they could exit the door there because mm -hmm. at that time researchers you could enter the library on all three floors right enter and exit okay yeah so you know I really appreciated that uh, now on the other hand Morarity ran the place with a tight fist and that's what I expected um, then Don Yezi came in and of course one of the first things that the directors you get a new director they want to reorganize so administratively, uh, while I was still film librarian, there were five of us that reported directly to Dave. Um, 
like I said, that worked out. Uh, I felt comfortable, that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, and then, yeah, the big one was in uh, 81. Uh, Due to the Hick, Hicks Library undergrad? Um, no. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That's, I've never, I don't have any evidence, but just prior to that, uh, John Wilshusen had been named director, and David had been bumped upstairs, and John tangled with the uh, dean of pharmacy big time. At about the same time, Carl Stafford had double booked himself to handle a slideshow for the president out at Westminster Village, or Westminster. Or Westwood, do we end up? Or no, what, what Westminster. For oh, the, the retirement? For the retirement. Okay. And, uh, and, oh, I can't remember the prof's name, the biology prof here on campus. He'd done a lot with uh, biology education. He, we had supported him. He had some pretty complex shows. And in that case, um, Carl had gotten one of the staff members to... Uh, take care of the president, and Carl took care of this biology prof. Well, the staff member messed up the president, big time. And it wasn't, the, it was the, those two things happened almost simultaneously. And then shortly after that, the university decided to dissolve the AV Center and move the equipment into uh, the Center for Instructional Services and the media was retained in the uh, in the libraries. Um, up until that point, the only thing that was going to move out to the uh, undergrad library was the instructional media center, the uh, where students could come in and listen to audio tapes and so on. Um, but after that, then the whole collection got moved out. And that was the film library then started reporting to the undergraduate library. I think that I, that didn't happen immediately. David was still in charge of undergrad library and uh, the films, the mm -hmm. instructional media center. And so that's after a while uh, there was a reorg there too, but uh, but that was the big change. Oh, okay. Well, then you moved. Is that what you went to uh, in, t in the information technology department then? Network access library. Oh no, I that spent several years uh, just working there in undergrad. Undergrad had never there never been a plan for it to have a hard copy card catalog. So one of the first jobs that I was assigned to was to come up with some sort of an automated catalog. So I don't know how I, I researched it or anything. We got a, uh, we took one of our preview rooms, turned it into a computer room with an NCR Unix-based tower, and then we put some uh, terminals up on the main floor and uh, set up a catalog that was based on a, just a standard database. We couldn't do everything that a normal catalog could do, but we had something sure. when the place opened. And uh, That you could access? And, yeah, the public could access. Right. Uh, the IT department didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole, so, so I did it. Uh, I pulled together a, uh, a uh, Apple computer network for the media center, and then uh, 
there was some, some friction there. Uh, and I had a staff member that was helping me with the tower, and uh, he was moved up to the IT department and retained that part of it. And, and then I, uh, I retained the rest of it, the microcomputers. Along that time, there was Emily was out of town, so Emily had become dean. David was no longer in charge of the undergrad library, and I was reporting to the undergraduate librarian. Um, and at that time, it was Judy Pask. Uh, Emily had taken me on, taken me out to lunch one day. I don't know how this all time fits, but she told me she was going to dissolve the AV Center, the Instructional Media Center. That, that was not going to exist. Okay. Well, I didn't help her. Uh, but one of the things that we did uh, became, a, when we moved into the uh, undergrad library, this is stepping back, is that we uh, provided services for the uh, physically challenged, uh, blind, mm -hmm. legally blind. Uh, uh, basically, that was getting books on tape and getting them out to the students. And if we couldn't get the books pre-recorded, then we had an arrangement with the uh, University bookstore to get books on loan that we would get recorded locally. That had to be the worst job I've ever had. Rewarding, but still the worst job. It was trying to get people to write, read those things. Uh, it was just awful. <laughs> so, uh, and get them done ahead of the students. And the students were constantly changing their schedule so you know how things go uh, so you know it's but Emily to go back Emily was out of town Betty Nelson whom I worked with very closely and I uh, can't remember the vice president for instructional services uh, anyway this was, Emily was reporting to him at the time. So he called me in for a meeting and said, we want you to start this uh, service, computer services for disabled. And he's a big honcho, so I just said, okay, Emily just hit the fan. She didn't like that at all. This was not library work. Emily had a very limited view of librarianship. And, uh, but we did it over her dead body. Uh, hired a fellow, which turned out probably not my best choice, but he was physically impaired, and uh, so he really had a f empathy for the students. Oh, sure, right. And called it the Alps Lab. That was uh, that was moved finally moved into the uh, Puck operation. So that was that was fine. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember when you had some involvement with, yeah. with the ones with the and, I, and Betty was running that out of the Dean of Student Office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we got an award for that, mm -hmm. uh, for all of that work. Uh, well, that was the uh, first thing that really pulled that together and was sort of the, the mm -hmm. inaugural for, mm -hmm. for it. The is. It is. We started it. Sure. We, we did it. Uh, along the, in there, uh, 
I don't know. I guess Emily, I, can, I don't know when exactly all of this happened. Um, I was, Emily wanted me to be on various committees and she sent me to Washington. And I never felt comfortable working at that level. But she did have me working. Uh, there was a university committee researching or discussing merging Puck and uh, the business office computing operation. It was really crazy to have two parallel computing operations of that size. It just wasn't cost effective. And I remember arguing, not arguing, but suggesting that if you're going to have merge those two computing operations, then you've got to look at technology in general and merging the telephone service, uh, the, uh, the TV, the whole thing. And actually, in the long, in the end run, that's what happened. So it's, uh, I was pleased to see that, but we were, the libraries was trying to get into electronic databases. And I was over in, uh, in that meeting room waiting for one of these meetings to start. John Steele and Dean Ringel, or Provost Ringel at that point, uh, were talking about this fund for the libraries and how they thought they could use that in a different way and change the direction of it. So. Uh, I don't, I don't understand why they did that because here I am, they know I'm in the libraries and they're sitting there discussing how to redirect this library money and I'm, hear, and I'm hearing everything that's going on so uh, you know, I hot footed it back after the meeting and got all to Emily and, uh, and she put the kibosh on that real fast. That was the basis, that money, that was our million dollar fund to start uh, database, public database access. So, you know, it's, those are the f things that I remember. About that time, I'm, I was trying to set up information access start out as a gopher and run the... Uh, I saw, yeah, I had gopher down, yeah. Run the uh, instructional media center. And I was going crazy. I couldn't do it. Uh, so Emily sent me in, put me into IT, and then from there... Okay, all right. We, uh, we went on. How long do you want this thing to run? Uh, it'll go to about 11.30, a little bit after. About okay. Hour. Um, I just want to ask, I think the researchers would be appreciated. On the government printing office, you got the World Wide Web. That, you know, I, I think they'd appreciate a comment yeah. on that. Yeah. Uh, I was that was the first time that it happened. That was uh, one of the first, first accesses, online accesses to the uh, Federal Register. Kerry Kerr was really a sharp young man. And, uh, he was, he technically put the whole thing together. I don't know. As I had all that much to do with it. But you were involved with but the project, I, sure. I was involved in the project right. and did a lot of legwork, people work. Kerry did the technical end. Right. And uh, so daily we'd get the files from. Uh, from GPO and uh, you know, merge them in and we'd have online access for all of the, for anybody who wanted it. So sure. I remember it wasn't even, wasn't right. limited Purdue, it was anybody. Anybody could have access. And that was, it came to the, really brought some national attention to the mm -hmm. libraries. Uh, the GPO had, uh, they were doing some research on use of electronic products and so on and technology and how they could better use that 
and they came to Purdue to see how we were doing this, as well as going to Walmart to see how they were doing it. Right, exactly. Right. So, yeah. you know, I think that was exciting. Yeah. Um, digital initiatives, librarian. How'd you get into that? The archives, is it? Is that uh, yeah. It? Yeah, that's kind of a long story. Well, just make uh, a, um, the archives official. What sort of things that were you involved in there? Well, there I was up in IT. Yeah, there wasn't any digital work being done in the archives. No, okay. no, I was up in the IT department. And, uh, That's information technology department researchers. And, yeah, and uh, things were not. This was along toward the end of Emily's term as dean, and she was backing away from administration. And uh, let's just say personnel-wise it was not a good time. And I was very frustrated. Jim had been uh, named dean and so I kind of waited about six months. I did an awful lot of praying, praying. and I had heard from the Lord to just wait, let him get his feet under him, and then I went to him and I said, hey, I'd like to move into this other spot. And it was a, uh, it was over in uh, Humanities Library and some of their technology work and he's he heard me out and then he came back with well would you set up the uh, digitization in the archives and at that point I said sure uh, I really want I enjoy getting things going making them operational and that's what I've done a most of my career here in the library. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. And so that's how I got into that. Yeah. And for research, a couple of the key, one of the key things I think that was involved was finally getting the Board of Trustees minutes. <laughs> oh, there was <laughs> lots of other projects. Lots of fun projects. Yeah. Um, Any the Board of one? Trustees was, was really a fun one. Uh, we proved that we could get it up and get it done in a reasonable amount of time with a quality job. Right. Now we didn't go in and try to do encoding with it or anything of the right. sort, but we made everything searchable. I think you should make a comment that the early, early years was all handwritten. F the first four volumes were handwritten. Right. They had to be transcribed. We got students to transcribe right. them. Um, I think that's key. And, and we were able to acquire a large amount of storage space, which was way more than what we needed, but wow, that's kept us going for years. I don't think we've had to buy much more. The, uh, we acquired some, uh, some heavy duty uh, scanning, some automated document feed uh, scanner so that uh, we can do high speed scanning on material that, you know, is not fragile. So that was fun. Uh, the, really, getting the Earhart collection completed, right. Right. that was difficult because, Katie, you know, we'd started it at one time. Emily stopped it. Uh, Sammy came in, reorganized everything, so then we had to have two item numbers <laughs> instead of one. Uh, but it was a joy to have that done, and w and I got to work with a lot of people worldwide that wanted reprints from that. Uh, it, was right. a, it was really good. Uh, we uh, there that, was that collection. A lot of people knew about it, and it really just put it up in the forefront, which was really good. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. The uh, debris again is used. Right. That's another one. So anyway. Any other projects? Those are kind of key ones. Um, Those were the key ones, I think. Yeah. You were on a couple of what, information technology uh, council or 
at one time, or did, was there a digital initiative steering committee? Oh, there was a digital initiative okay. steering committee. It never really got off the ground. Okay, okay, okay. Were you ever on any university committees? No? Well, yeah, the the one for uh, merging okay. computer. Okay, for the puck and, and the business office? Yeah. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, the, I don't, that wasn't a faculty senate committee, but that was, was an administrative sure. university okay. level committee. We okay. had people from all over the university talking about it. Yes. Okay. Family. Um, do you have children? Yeah. Okay. Three okay. kids. Grandchildren? Uh, seven. Ooh. Okay. Do your children live in the close by in the community or? Uh, two of them are within driving distance. One's out in California. Okay. Alrighty. Were you a faculty fellow at any time? No. In residence house. Okay. No. And you are the recipient of the John H. Moriarty Award. Yeah. Which is really nice. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Uh, the only non-MLS person to ever receive that. Oh, well, that's all right. Then that's good. That, that's good. Uh, um, the prof uh, professional associations who are involved in what? At, uh, consor you said the Consortium of University Film, Film Centers, Centers. And uh, Consortium of College and University Media Centers. Same thing. Okay. They just and renamed. Educational it. Film Association. Are you still involved in any associations at no, all since you retired? No. Okay. No. I spent uh, quite a bit of time working with the uh, oh yeah it's a regional association of uh, the uh, software that we used that's okay you can insert it when you get the thing that's fine now uh, I gotta remember it it's uh, okay so uh, you were, you were, we were the group chair for that Midwest Content DM Users Group. Yeah, it was the Content DM User Group. That's the one I'm thinking of. Okay. And I was Is that still going? Uh, as far as I know. Okay. Uh, they've reorganized probably. Uh, but that was under OCLC. Okay. And, yeah, I chaired one. And you had a meeting One here. One uh, meeting, co-chaired it, I guess. That was down in Indy, and then we had one meeting up here. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that was one of the things I wanted to do before I retired, okay. have a conference here. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, pr a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us or an outstanding event in your life? No. I, <laughs> I'll share this one. When I first arrived here, it was just 68. And if you remember, things were kind of rocky on college campuses. This was the Vietnam War, and Madison, they were burning buildings, and so on. And Purdue was a hotbed of tranquility. It was really quiet here. Uh, engineers, they stuck their nose into the books and kept at it. Uh, anyway, I was... The AV Center was on the ground floor of Stewart Center. And I came in to work early one morning. There's this guy walking around down there on the ground floor with a rifle. And I asked him what he was doing. He said, well, I need to find out how to get out of here, but what are you doing with the rifle? Oh, President Hovde decided to post snipers on top of the Stewart Center. He was going off duty. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, um, retirement. What are your retirement activities? Oh, I'm working with the church. Okay. Just uh, In nothing. Te te electronics? Or was there oh, some, you know, nothing uh, really strenuous to be. I do a lot of work with the food pantry. Okay and uh, getting food pulled for various recipients. Do you work down there at, the, at their facility? At the church. Oh, at the church. Oh, they have a food pantry at the church. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then uh, I do some data entry for them. We're slowly working with our uh, web page to totally reorganize it, get that going. And uh, 
I've worked with the church management system to do some maintenance with that. So. Okay. Uh, I'm going to leave the final thing to you. Anything that I forgot to ask or in summary, if you'd like to make any comments? It's always been great working here at Purdue. I've always enjoyed it. You plan to uh, stay in the community? Oh, yeah. Okay. Most of the families here, so this is where we'll sure, stay. Sure, right. Uh, it's just a great place to be. Didn't think we'd like it. We planned to be here for a year or two and then move on. But I think that's a lot of people have said that, and they're here for a long time. Yeah, I, I don't plan on doing a whole lot with, with Purdue itself. I, I'll work with the church. Sure, okay. Those are the rewarding things. Put your and marbles where you want to. Yeah, I've got a grandson over at uh, Indiana Wesleyan. Okay. want to try to get over there and watch some of his basketball games. Got a granddaughter that's a senior, and she's playing soccer, so we're spending a lot of time going to soccer games this year. Good. Connie's still teaching, but at some point she'll quit that, and we'll both be doing things. She loves to cook, so she'll probably be preparing meals for people that need them. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Carl, I want to thank you very much. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. Particularly since we both came the same year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Carl. <laughs>